Caracas, Venezuela. The small Spanish colonial type city high up in the mountains of the north coast of South America, which throughout the booming bank busting 50s here was mushrooming into what was intended to be the most startling, the most dazzling, the most modern city in the whole world. But it's surprising these days in Venezuela and particularly in Caracas, how people talk not so much of what things are like today, but of what they were way back in 1958 in the days of PJ. PJ was Perez Jimenez, a shameless military dictator who needed that the symbols of his power and glory should rise up before him month by month in terms of steel and concrete. Caracas, he had decided, should be his monument to his 20th century greatness. Put the seven wonders of the ancient world together in one mountain valley. Add the Rockefeller Center and the M1 and about half a dozen Hammersmith flyovers. Add the palace at Versailles, the Luxembourg Gardens, Ascot Racetrack, Wembley Stadium and the Taj Mahal. And you begin to get some idea of the kind of capital that Jimenez was trying to build. In 10 years, in a country of 6 million people, half of them, to this day, cannot read and write. But it seemed he had got plenty of money. He had half a million pounds a day dropping into his lap from the takings of the oil companies down at Lake Maracaibo. He began by smashing an avenue six lanes wide through the center of the old colonial type city. This is the result of his efforts, the Avenue Bolivar. At that time, he intended to get every great architect in the world to put up one building in this avenue. Heaven knows what he'd do with the buildings. At the end of the avenue, rising 25 stories high, he built this little lot the centro. In these gigantic twin towers, he put the paid servants of his dictatorship. The Treasury, the Ministry of Development, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Sanitation, the Ministry of Health. In these fantastic towers, there were none but government officers, government clerks, government typists, government porters, government doormen, government chauffeurs, government liftmen. But so far, the Venezuelans felt so good. This was a growing country, a rich country. Let the world see Venezuela could build a capital to be proud of. PJ built roads. Roads like the Autopista from Maiqueta Airport, which cost two million pounds a mile and involved bridges and tunnels, one of them one and a half miles long. The blasting went on night and day. The bonuses were high, the death roll was long. He built roads within the city, Los Angeles-type junctions like this one that they call the Octopus, soon filled with the cars of the boom timers. Boom, boom, boom. Caracas was booming like mad. Construction was going on 24 hours a day. The plantation workers from the interior swarmed into the capital and set up their shacks on the hillsides. And PJ found work for all. By this time, most of his enemies were in exile or in jail. Most of his friends were in the contracting business. His schemes were never ending, and they got grander all the time. The dictator had come to power on the army's back, and he did not forget the army now. He built for them too. This is the club PJ built to prove beyond doubt who are the aristocrats in this new society. Foot for foot, this is said to be the most expensive building ever erected in South America. Certainly it's the most expensive officers club in the world. There are apartments and swimming pools for the officers and their children. There were dining rooms with more waiters than guests. and an open-air dance floor laid in the finest marble that money could buy. Here, over the rum punches and the whiskey sodas, fortunes were made, careers and even lives ended. To display his privileged soldiers to his people, PJ built this modest parade ground, about big enough to take the Russian army all at once. 
and these stands where he and his friends could take thrilling comfort from the sight of the guardians of their power in full stride. Near this parade ground, he built the gardens, the mainly marble and concrete gardens. Gardens to make the ones at Versailles look like a backyard, with four massive concrete bosom dianas to every fountain, and urns big as the cement mixers from whose womb they came, score after score of them, acre after acre. Just imagine making a fortune by making objects like these. The biggest scheme begun in PJ's time was this one, the helicoid, an attempt to turn a mountain into concrete. A spiral road winds up around the perimeter and inside the mountain were to be the shopping and office and entertainment facilities for an entire city. The size of this thing dwarfs any single piece of building construction ever tackled anywhere. The folly to end all follies. There were to be great stores by the hundred. Five cinemas, car parks, walks and gardens, hotels, restaurants, nightclubs, theatres, and even, appropriately enough, an arena for what were vaguely called spectacles. There she is, floor after floor of it, an empty concrete mountain. Private firms are still struggling on with the work, a monster too big to abandon, too big to finish. Well, by the time he got round to building the Avenue of the Heroes, the sheer, wasteful, insane vanity of some of PJ's dreams in concrete was growing plain for everybody to see. To the thousands still living in the corrugated iron and cardboard ranchitos on the hillsides, this kind of monument wasn't the embodiment of the national ideal which PJ talked about at all. This was just a very bad joke. the country had begun to feel heartily sick of soldiers and monuments. And sicker still of monuments of soldiers. PJ wanted all the world to witness the marvels of his new city. And into his mind came the most scintillating idea of all. This is it. A cable railway over the mountain jungle to the top of the high mountain between the city and the sea. As they were swept up in the cable car, the fastest, of course, in the world, every citizen, every foreign visitor would be able to see each detail of this miraculous city of Caracas laid out below him. Even the rulers of greater powers would not have such a showplace. Look on my work, she mighty, and despair. And a team of Swiss engineers made sure that ye mighty could look at everything. And on the top, P.J. built the Humboldt Hotel, a gigantic lighthouse of a place reaching up 16 stories above the highest point on the mountain, a vast cylindrical monstrosity, luxurious, spacious, and a crashing financial failure from the first day. These cars were meant to carry the passengers from the top of the cable railway to the hotel door. Where else in the world could they have a taxi service like this? Now the bubble cars hang disused and empty. The hotel rooms and the public lounges gather only dust. The dining rooms, apart from a few curiosity seekers who come for Sunday lunch, stay empty too. The terraces, only a few feet from the great buildings, are cracking. And the lizard and the fern are taking the mountain back. By this time, even the massive oil revenues had been squandered and the PJ government was in debt to the tune of some hundreds of millions of pounds. Well, in the end, of course, he overreached himself. And in January 1958, the people of the city decided that they'd had enough of terror and extravagance and they staged their 51st revolution. There were two days of riots. And then even those favoured sons, the army, decided that he would have to go. Somebody in that military school picked up a telephone. 
and in the late evening of January the 23rd, 1958, the citizens of the town could hear the drone of a DC-4 taking off for an unknown destination. Aboard were PJ and all of his closest and richest friends. The legend is that he left behind, by mistake, one suitcase. Didn't contain very much by PJ standards, just a million bolivars, or about a hundred thousand pounds. The cynic said that it was intended for tips on the journey to Miami, Florida. And in Florida, PJ lives to this day, the life of a retired, modest, multi-millionaire. Good night.